Today we're continuing our series on the book of Galatians, a series we've actually been in since January. Um, before we do that, I think I would be um, amiss to, um, I wasn't really sure how to go about this, but to address um, a strange thing that happened yesterday. How many heard the, in the news what happened with uh, the uh, attempted assassination of Donald Trump? Um, my initial response was anger. I was kind of mad, and um, that's never a good thing on either side of the political spectrum when a, a president is assassinated, obviously. And we live in such a volatile political environment. I've never seen it. It seems like every year, every, every election cycle gets more and more volatile. So, um, but we're Christians, and we get to stand, we get to pray, we get to um, bring another message. We, you know, it's interesting that last, I think it was last week I was talking about, that there is a political spirit. There is a political spirit, and I'm, I'm all for politics. I think we should be engaged in politics, and perhaps now more than ever, we'll talk a little bit about that in the future. You know, as a nonprofit, we can't officially endorse parties or candidates, but we can certainly talk about issues, and we do that from time to time. From time to time, it's not my favorite thing to do, but from time to time, we do talk about issues. So it's something we, we uh, can do and will do as a church, but the political environment is so toxic. It, and and here's, here's what, um, we can live above that. We can live above that political spirit, can't we? And when you have networks calling someone Hitler for eight years and saying, this is the end of democracy if this person's get elected, of course people are going to lash out and do violent things. And I don't know the motives behind this particular individual yet. So there's not much to know about it. But let's stand and let's pray. Um, I think we witnessed a miracle yesterday. Tragedy in the sense that, um, tragedy in the sense that um, a person lost their life, obviously. Um, another person, at least one, was wounded. Um, but, I mean, Donald Trump was, what, an inch away from, from, from being... Uh, um, like the Kennedy assassination. I mean, what an awful image that would have been for us. So, um, so let's pray. Let's hold out your hands. Let's just pray for this nation. Pray for Father. We love you. We thank you for this nation. I believe this is, I believe this is the greatest nation on earth, Lord. You have a prophetic plan, purpose, and destiny for the United States of America. God, America has been the nation. It has sent more missions all around the world than any other nation, Lord. And God, it's because of that freedom and it's because of that prosperity that we've been able to, to uh, propagate and preach the gospel all around the world, Lord. So God, we thank you for this nation. We thank you that the founders for what this country is, Lord God. And though no country is perfect and no country um, um, doesn't have a past, Lord God, this is a good country, Lord God. And we thank you for it. We thank thank you for liberty. We thank you for freedom. We thank you, Lord, for this place, Lord. We lift up, um, we lift up uh, President Biden. We lift up Donald Trump. God, I just pray for the safety of our uh, political leaders, Lord God. And I just pray for a calming of the political atmosphere. We, we plead the blood of Jesus and ask for protection over these politicians, Lord. And we just pray for the spiritual atmosphere to calm down, for the kingdom of God to come in. And God, I also pray for a resurgence of kingdom values, Lord God. Kingdom values to be re-emerged. Um, God, would you bring this nation back to God? We ask this. We bless you. We love you. In Jesus' mighty name. And everyone said... Amen, amen, amen. Why don't you guys have a seat? Okay. No jokes today, because we got to go. <laughs> Sorry. Come back. Come back. Oh, someone clapped. Yeah. All right. <laughs> it's all good. <clears throat> We're going to do Galatians 5, 13 through 18. Paul has been proving to the, Gala the, the, the believers in the region of Galatia that it is by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, that we stand righteous before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's jump right in. The title of my message this morning is called Wits. Everyone say Wits. Walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what it says. We're just going to jump right in. That is verse 16, of course, but... We need to have our wits about us. We need to walk in the Spirit. If you're a Christian, you are destined, and God has called you to walk in the Holy Ghost, walk in the Spirit. I don't know about you, but if, I, if you just do a survey of your life over the past six months, if you're like me, there's definitely moments where you're like, yeah, I was walking in the Spirit, hopefully most of the time, right? If you're like me, it's like, yeah, I was walking in the Spirit, you know? But if you're like me, you also had a few moments over the last six months that perhaps 
you were walking in the flesh and you knew it. Do you ever have those moments like, I'm just, I'm not walking in the Holy Ghost right now. I'm walking in the flesh. You know, I'm fearful, I'm angry, I'm, you know, whatever. I have doubts, you know, those different kind of things, anxieties. I know I'm not walking in the Spirit. But you and I, Christians, we are called to walk in the Holy Ghost. How do we do this? Let's break down the text. We're going to start in verse 13, Galatians 5, 13. He says this, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. First of all, I want to point out that God has called us to be free. Jesus has called you to walk free. Now, if you're not walking free, I have good news for you. There's more for you. God wants you to be free. Free from what? Free from sin, of course. Free from legalism, religiosity, guilt, shame, our past, the devil, even free from ourselves, even free from our fallen nature, the flesh. If you're bound up in any way this morning, if you're encumbered by the flesh in any way, there is more for you. My, my message this morning is not one of condemnation, but one of hope. God has more for you. His plan for you is better than you think. It's better than you think. Find out who you are in Christ Jesus, and you'll never want, you'll never want to be anyone else. Sometimes, don't we, don't we do that? Sometimes, oh, I wish I was that person. I wish I had what that person had. I wish, you know, right? You will never want to be anyone but you if you find out who God made you to be. You'll be jealous of yourself. <laughs> we're so blessed that sometimes we're jealous of ourselves, amen? <laughs> <clears throat> but the grace of God, here's the deal, here's the deal. If you indulge in the sinful nature and you use, and I, I talked about this question last week, won't people, if we preach the unmerited grace and favor and love of Jesus, won't people use that as a license for, for, to sin? Here's the deal about sin, though. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. Every time. You might think, oh, like, oh, yeah, God will just forgive me. It's okay. You know, his love is so good. I'm just going to, but I'm going to indulge in the flesh a little bit. It will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. But the grace of God will take you on the adventure of a lifetime. Learn how to walk in the Spirit. Learn how to operate in the grace of God for your life. And I promise you, it will be the adventure of a lifetime. It says this, verse 13. This is the uh, New King James Version. I'm going to just switch versions here. You, my brethren, were called to liberty, but do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another in love. Do not use your liberty as a, um, an opportunity to indulge in the flesh. Apparently, it is the case that the freedom of God, the liberty of God, can be mishandled, can be misused. Have you ever seen someone mishandle something, mishandle a situation, mishandle a tool, right? Like sometimes my wife will be um, trying to use a, a butter knife for a screwdriver. It's like, that's mishandling. <laughs> Go get yourself a flathead screwdriver. <clears throat> the love of God is so powerful. The forgiveness of God is so immense. Some might be tempted to take advantage of it to indulge in the desires of the flesh. Now, is it possible to do that? Apparently, yes. Apparently, the grace of God is so good, you can't take advantage of it. You, the liberty that God has given you, you can't take advantage of it. But that's a misuse of liberty. That's a misuse of the freedom that God has given you. Uh, let, me, let me give you an illustration. You can use your head for a hammer, but that isn't a very good use of your head now, is it? I've got a sermon illustration here. You can use your head as a hammer. But that's not a good use of your head now, is it? This is what it's like when we like, I'm going to indulge in the flesh because God's just going to forgive me anyway. Listen, it's stupid. Don't do that. You look silly. You're hurting yourself. And you're probably hurting other people around you. Let me give you another illustration. How many... How many ranchers do we have in the room? You're, you, you raise livestock. Any ranchers in the house? All right, we've got a few. Raise it, raise it loud and raise it, raise it proud. What's that? Chickens. chickens. Okay, Hannah has chickens. How many chicken people we have here? Chickens, okay. Chicken ranchers. 
chickens on the range there. Free range chickens. Now, if you're going to move livestock, or you're going to move a cow from one place to one town to another, um, <clears throat> what do you use to do that? What do you use to do that? Say that again. You use a trailer, a livestock trailer, right? Okay, we have a picture of a livestock trailer. Go ahead and put it up. We have, do we have that livestock trailer? There it is, okay. That's the proper way to move livestock. I want to show you the improper way to move livestock. Go ahead and roll that video. Around 10 a.m., the Norfolk Police Division responded to a call of a man driving eastbound on 275 with a Watusi bull in his passenger seat. Uh, well, uh, the officers received a call reference a car driving into town that had a, a cow in it. Um, they thought that it was going to be, you know, like a calf, something smaller, something that actually fit inside the vehicle. And the vehicle was big enough. Well, technically. As a result, the, the officer performed a traffic stop and addressed some traffic violations that were occurring. Uh, with that particular uh, situation. The occupant of the vehicle was identified as Lee Meyer of Neely. The Watusi Bull's name was Howdy Doody. He was immediately pulled over by Norfolk Police and they performed a routine traffic stop. The officer wrote him some warnings. Um, there were some citable issues with that situation. The officer chose to write him a warning and ask him to take the animal back home and, and to leave the city. Meyer and Howdy Doody are on their way back home and no one was hurt. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media. There, <coughs> there were some citable violations. <coughs> Technically, the vehicle was big enough for the cow. But is that the proper way to move a cow? No. Here's the deal with using the liberty of God and the grace of God as a license for sin, if you are misusing the supernatural freedom that God has given you as a license to sin, you're misusing it. That's like using your head as a hammer. How I many think that's a good idea? You look silly, you're hurting others, you're, you're definitely hurting yourself, and you're missing out on the adventure of a lifetime with the Holy Spirit, amen? He says this, though, you, my brothers and sisters, you're called to be free. Do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. Rather, instead, serve one another humbly in love. Now, Paul says, replace that, that, that fleshly desire of, uh, to sin with something else. I just want to say, if you're struggling with ungodliness, you're struggling with a particular sin, you're stuck in a certain pattern, it's not a good idea to sit around and try not to sin. Like, I'm sitting at home, I used to go drink on Saturday night, but now I'm home, and I'm trying not to sin. That's actually not a good idea, because what are you going to do? You're going to think about what you're not doing. Rather, be about something. Engage your spirit. He says, don't indulge in the sinful nature. Rather, serve one another humbly and love. God's goal for you is to, God's goal for you is not to get you to not do stuff. His goal for you is to get you to be someone, that person that he's created you to be. And so if your focus is, my goal is to not do stuff or not do things, no. My goal is to be transformed in the image of Jesus and be who he's always created me to be. Hey, Amen? Replace, see, many of us, we're trying, to, uh, uh, we're trying to deny the flesh, but we forgot to replace it with something. We forgot to put something in its place. <clears throat> Denying the flesh is a great thing to do. Crucifying the old man is a great thing to do. But here's the deal. If that happens in your life, it creates a vacuum. There is a power vacuum. You know, uh, the, the Greek word in the Bible for flesh is the Greek word sarex. And it's presented often as a power opposed to the spirit, in opposition to the spirit. So it, when we're denying ourselves, we're denying our flesh, there's actually a power vacuum. Oftentimes there's a time vacuum. And, and how many know there's a passion vacuum within that? And we need to fill that time vacuum, that power vacuum, um, that passion vacuum with something else. That's an empty space that needs to be filled. You know, if you go, uh, for example, the United States, if we go topple a foreign government, 
Um, it's not often the best thing to do to just topple that completely because there can often create a power vacuum within that country. You got to be careful of those kind of things. When there's power vacuums in countries, that creates issues. But I'm convinced that many Christians, we fall back into old habits because we didn't properly, properly fill the vacuum by walking in love. See, you weren't just supposed to not sin, try not to sin. You were supposed to fill that vacuum with now engaging your spirit by loving the world around you. <clears throat> during the 2020, during the pandemic, many people were sitting idle at home. And what did we do with that idle time? Most people gained weight. People who drank, drank more. People who were depressed got more depressed because of the isolation. And in many cases, the cure was worse than the disease. There was a vacuum in our lives, and a lot, of t a lot of people really struggled during that time. Culturally, many people got worse because there was a vacuum. We need to fill that power vacuum in our lives. When we, we start removing the things that the Lord says no to, we need to replace it with loving one another. One of the best things you can do, for example, for a person who's struggling with depression is get them doing something. Get them serving somewhere. Go serve at a soup kitchen. Go serve at your local church. Get your eyes off of yourself and get your eyes on something, something other than yourself. If you're just marinating on your problems and what's going on in your life, that is often a recipe to just stay in that place. By the way, there are many opportunities here within the church uh, to serve. If you want to jump on one of our teams, we would be honored to, to get you plugged in, and, and it would be a life-giving experience for you. Verse 14, let's move on. He says this, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. Paul says the, the entire law, all 613 commandments of the law can boil down to love God, love others. When Jesus was asked this question, teacher, which is the greatest uh, command in, in, the, in the Old Testament and the law, and Jesus, would say, Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Paul, in this uh, particular text, he doesn't even bother to mention love God because it is obviously inferred. In fact, in 1 John 4.20, John says this, if someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. For if we don't love people who we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? You can't go around, I hate, I hate that person. I hate, 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 hate. And then be like, but I love God so much. You're a liar. You're lying. You're lying to yourself. You're lying to others. You can't go around hating everyone and loving God. That's a good word for someone right there. You need the Holy Spirit to help you forgive. You will fulfill the law by loving others, by serving others. He says this in verse 15. But if you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will destroy each other. There's a warning here. If we bite and devour one another, listen, this happens in families. You know families like this that are biting and devouring one another. Church, this can happen in churches. Church splits happen all the time. People are, what are they doing? They're biting and devouring one another. They're destroying one another. Workplaces can, of course, look like this. In 1 Peter 5.8, it says this, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We need to be sober. We need to be vigilant. Why? Because the enemy of our soul is prowling around looking for something who he may devour. Now, he's looking for vulnerabilities in your life to devour you. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and he's looking for ways to do that in our lives. He's looking for someone to devour, but how much more successful would the devil be if he can get you and me to do the devouring for him? Come into a church and like he's, he's the devourer, but if he can get us to devour one another, it's like he can just sit back and be like, I'll let you all devour each other. You're doing all the work for me. Come on. Watch out. The devil uh, walks around looking for someone to devour. Verse 16. This is, this is the antidote right here. Paul says this, so I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You won't gratify the lusts of the flesh if you are in the Spirit. It says it like this in the King James Version, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fill the lust of the flesh. Again, wits, walk in the Spirit. Have your wits about you. You have your wits about you. Why? You have, did you know you have God with you? God did not send a representative to come live in your heart. He himself came and took up residence in your heart. 
I think sometimes we lose sight of this, that we are the holy temple of the Lord. We are the holy, he lives among us. He lives within us. We are the holy temple of the Lord. We have our wits about us because we've got the Holy Spirit with us. Now, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Well, let's talk about this. You know, when you see people walk, people walk with a different gait, different cadence. People run with a different gait and cadence. Uh, when I'm at home and I'm downstairs, like sitting on the couch, and I can hear someone coming down the stairs, I can often tell who's coming down the stairs just by the way that person walks. People in your family, they walk different, right? And when you walk, look at someone walk, they, they, they walk a little bit different. We're part of a, a running group on Wednesday nights. We get together, and there's runners and walkers. And um, when I'm in that group and I hear someone running behind me, I've been part of that group for like 10 years, and I'm really familiar with all the runners of that group. And I can often tell, oh, someone, this person's about to pass me because I, I know the way that they breathe. I know that the way their, their feet sound on the, on the gravel, their, their, their cadence and their gait just sounds a certain way. You could become very familiar with that. But walk in the spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know, you can tell when someone often is walking with God. You can just tell because it's all over their life. They're like, that person is walking with God. They're walking in the spirit. They have intimacy with the Lord. They have a relationship with the Lord. And oftentimes you can tell when someone is going through a season where it's like, I think they're struggling right now. You know, <clears throat> just to give an example, but people who are, you know, ministering on the platform, how many know that people who are up here, God's given them a gift? There's a, there's a gift, a gift of playing an instrument, a gift of preaching. But oftentimes you can kind of tell if someone, you know, is going through something because in addition to the gift, what do you want? You want the presence of the Lord. You want the anointing on someone's life. And sometimes you can see someone, the presence of God is on their life, and then they'll go through a season where it's like, the gift is still there. They're still operating that gift, but the presence, I'm not sensing the presence like I used to. You know what I'm saying? And then sometimes it comes back. You can kind of tell when someone is walking in the Spirit and when someone is cultivating that intimacy with the Lord. And this is true, of course, of interpersonal relationships. You can just kind of tell when someone's they're going through a season, aren't they? How do we walk in the Spirit? Walking in the Spirit is simply walking and acknowledging that God is with you, being mindful of this person that is within you. Bill Johnson gives this illustration <clears throat> that um, he was talking about the presence of God, and he said it's like if you have a dove on your shoulder and you don't want that dove to fly away, what do you do? You walk about very carefully. You're not, you're not reckless. You're not running around. Every step you take is being mindful of the dove that's on your shoulder because you don't want it to fly away. This is what it's like when we walk in the Spirit. We're being mindful that a person, the Holy Spirit, actually lives inside of your heart. Yeah. <clears throat> when you walk in the Spirit, you will want to please Him. You will want to walk with Him. It says this in Romans 8.8, 8, Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God cannot please God in the realm of the flesh. Now, that doesn't mean God doesn't love you. If you're in the realm of the flesh, God still loves you, but you're not living a life pleasing to him. How many have ever dealt with conflict with other, another person? <laughs> never? Never. Have you ever had a, have a conversation with someone? I'm not saying there's a time and place for, you know, conflict and bold communication and, you know, saying things you need to say. But have you ever been talking with somebody like, I want to, I need, I'm going to, I want to tell them something. I'm going to, I'm going to give them a piece of my mind. There's, there's maybe a way, a certain way that your flesh very much wants to respond <clears throat> in that situation. But do you ever <clears throat> step back and you should, this is how you walk in the spirit and say, Holy Spirit, how do you see this person? Show me who they are to you. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, how do you see this situation? What's going on? And sometimes the Holy Spirit say, well, this, they're reacting this way because they're in fear. They're reacting this way. Or there's something that, you know, you need to ask them if you've offended them. You know, oftentimes the Holy Spirit will give you insight so that you respond in the Spirit, right? Not respond in the flesh. <clears throat> Let me give you another way to, to walk in the Spirit. Live in God's word. Live according to the, the, the Bible says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to his word. Live according to the word. You know, the Holy Spirit and the word of God are in agreement. 
right? Jesus, the Word of God, and the Spirit of God are in perfect agreement. And if you want to learn to walk in the Spirit, I'm telling you, man, get in this book. Get in this book, stay in this book, and, and meditate on it. That's how we walk in the Spirit. Verse 17, it says this, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. There are two opposing forces constantly fighting each other so that at times we can't carry out the good intentions that we want to. You know, if you read Romans chapter 7, Paul talks about the good I will to do, I can't do, and the, the, the bad that I don't want to do, that I do. And he talks about this wrestling and this contention that's happening. Now, personally, I think that's Paul's commentary about trying to live under the law. That is life under the law. The, the good I'm trying to do, I can't do it, and I can't stop sinning. I don't think that's normal Christianity. I do think, but I do think Christians all the time find themselves in a Romans chapter 7 situation where they're contending with the flesh. But our spirit desires what is contrary to the flesh, and the flesh desires that carnality, that earthly desire, desires what is contrary to the spirit. They're in conflict with one another. Your fallen sinful nature does not want to please God. And we have to go back to this, and I think it's important to remember this. When you got saved, what part of you got saved? Go ahead, go ahead and put up that uh, little diagram there. Your spirit got saved. What does that mean? Perfected forever. That is the part of you washed in the blood of Jesus, holy, righteous, perfected forever. Your spirit. That's your standing before God right now. That's righteousness. Your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions is not perfected. Mine's not perfected. You can ask my wife. What are we in? We're in a process. We're in a process of renewal. We're in a process of denying our flesh. We're in a process of laying down our will and picking up his will. Your spirit's perfected, your soul's in process, and your body is promised. God's got a new body for us in heaven, amen? You are in a process, a process of denying your flesh, picking up your cross, and following Jesus. Your flesh doesn't want to do that, but your spirit does. And Paul gives this amazing statement. This is verse 18, and we're coming to the end here. Verse 18, but if you are led by the Spirit, it's Galatians 5.18, you are not under the law. Whoa. What does this mean? Now, the law is holy, righteous, and good. We, we don't say the law doesn't matter anymore. But he says here, if you're under grace, if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. What does this mean? I don't steal not because the law said no. I don't steal because grace said serve one another in love. I don't want to steal because love doesn't steal. I don't lie. Not because the law said no. I don't lie because love doesn't want to deceive one another. I want to be a truthful man. I want to be a man of integrity. I don't commit adultery. Not because the law said no. I'm faithful because grace empowered me to want to be faithful and to be a faithful man. Here's the deal. The liberty that God has given us is not the right to sin. The liberty God has given you is the right to do the will of God that he's called you to. It's the liberty to do God's will, not to get away with stuff. It's liberty to be who he's always called you to be. It's liberty to be like Jesus. It's liberty to not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the Spirit. That's the grace of God for you. It's a misuse of the liberty and the grace of God to, as a license to sin, to, ha to have lawlessness in your life. It is a proper use of the grace of God to, to use that as a tool to walk in what God has always called you to be. It's the liberty to do God's will. Let me wrap up with this. <clears throat> we have a dog named Hunter. Why Hunter, do you ask? Well, he destroyed a laptop. Okay, some of you got that joke. Okay. That was a joke. It's not true. He didn't destroy a laptop. We have a dog named Hunter. My daughter named him Hunter. Okay. So that's going to sink in for some of you later. Come on, let's loosen up here. We have a dog named Hunter. He's a Doberman Pinscher. And when he was a puppy, uh, he did puppy things. He made messes. He chewed. Um, our house bears the scars of an immature dog. Um, you know, we have this wood banister, and I don't know why 
he felt like that was a good idea to chew on that. We have other, then we still haven't fixed it. You know, it's been, how old is he? Three years now? Come up, almost three years. He stayed in the dog run while we were gone. We had to lock him in the kennel because he couldn't be trusted, right? We couldn't trust him, but he grew up. We trained our dog and our dog now is a really, really good dog. Very smart, very, very obedient dog. <clears throat> How good of a dog is he? I want to brag on my dog today. All right. He's a good boy. <clears throat> How good of a dog? When we go to walk him, we usually don't take a leash with us because I can walk out the front door and I'll say, Hunter, heel, and he'll stay right here. And I can walk through the neighborhood, cross the roads, and then we kind of get to a place like, okay, there's no one around. We're kind of an open field. And I'll say, Hunter, free. And then he'll go run around and he'll be free. And he can play and chase birds and different things, but he doesn't go far. And if I see, and if I see someone come, like, Hunter, he'll come back. He'll come back and he'll, he'll heal up right next to me and he'll stay right there. In fact, we'll, we'll be walking on a path next to people with their dogs on a leash. And the dog's like, you know, trying to get our dog. And our dog's just kind of like, you know, walking. I'll just kind of, kind of look at him. He's a really good dog. We take him out. We don't even take a leash half the time. He doesn't run away. Why doesn't my dog run away? <clears throat> he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to run away. He wants to be with us. He wants to be close to us. He wants, he'll bark at us to take, you know, go take him on a walk. He wants to go on a walk. He's a very, he needs activity. He doesn't want to run away. He wants to be with us. He wants to please us. I, have a, I, brought our, I brought his leash today, which we don't often use because he doesn't need it. I don't need a leash because I have something better. I have a trained dog that wants to please us. What do I mean? Where am I going with this? The grace of God is superior to the written rules, the written code. We read this, um, all right, there you go. We read this verse a couple weeks ago, but listen, this is the grace of God. The grace of God is superior to the written code. God doesn't need to put you on the leash if you have grace. You don't need to be controlled if you have grace because you're free to operate in God's will. <clears throat> Titus chapter 2, 11 through 14, we read this a couple weeks ago. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And a lot of people stop right there, like, yay, thanks for the grace of God, offered me salvation. Let's go home and continue sinning. No, 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 no. Verse 12, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, to live a life self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. I like how he said in this present age, because it's always, you know, it's, it's rough, right? Verse 13, while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. That's what the grace of God will do in your life. It teaches you to say no to ungodliness. It teaches you, to, no, that's not God's will for me. And it makes you eager to live in the spirit to do the will of God. Grace saves us. It teaches us, no to, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness. And it makes us eager to do good, the will of God. Not being under the law doesn't mean living lawlessness. Being under grace is the freedom to walk in the will of God. I could get up here and we could get up here and we could preach a leash. Thou shall not, boom, thou shall not do this. Live this way, live that way. And oftentimes we'll, we'll talk about what the, the standards of the, the scripture are. We talk about the Bible. Of course, we should read it all. It's all good. But I don't get up here and preach a leash because I have something better. I have the grace of God that I can preach to you. And the grace of God will speak to your heart and it will constrain you and it will compel you. It will compel you to love. It will compel you. It will constrain you if the Holy Spirit, Spirit says, don't say that, don't do that, don't go there, don't open that door. When you have the grace of God, you're like my dog. You won't want to run away. You'll just want to, why would I want to run away? Why would I want to run away? I want to be close to my Savior. I want to be close to my Master. I don't want a wall between us. Come on. Why don't you guys stand on your feet this morning? Sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want it to cost you. <clears throat>